Okay. Well, uh, good morning. As Xavi said, we're going to talk about video analysis uh, during these two sessions. So for the motivation of why we want to work with videos, I think it's a, a kind of a very natural problem. So, so far, most of the talks have been about uh, working with images, but you know that we don't really see still images, right? We see motion, we see like, mo uh, movement, we see video after all. So that's why I think it's a very natural extension to go to video instead of images, although you will see that this poses some new challenges that we need to address. So this is, is the outline of the presentation. So the first part will be about something that uses videos, but actually is not about analyzing the videos themselves. You will see why. And the rest of the, uh, of the talk will be about uh, which kind of CNN or neural network architectures we can use for, for videos. Um, also, about how to exploit the redundancy in videos. You will see that this is a very special case of a signal. And some things that we don't see in images, we have them in video. So how can we uh, exploit this? And finally, I'll give some tips and tricks uh, that actually they apply to any deep learning on any signal, but they are especially important for video because we have a lot of computations that we need to do here. So it's very important to do this efficiently. So let's talk about uh, self-supervision first. So what's the idea of self-supervision? Uh, so you, you know that these neural nets need lots of data points to be trained on. So this is usually hard to collect. Actually, what's hard to collect are the, the annotations. So the data is there. You can go to YouTube, you can go to Flickr, or any website, and you can download lots of data. So you can download many, many images. The problem is, what do you do with them, right? So you need your data points x, so OK, that's the input. You need the ground truth y, and then you want to feed your neural net to somehow map from x to y. So getting the x's is easy. Getting the y's is difficult, right? So OK, we have these good, some good data sets for some tasks. You have, for instance, this famous ImageNet data set. OK, but what if you don't have an ImageNet to train on to start with, OK? So the idea is, can we somehow collect data uh, and then collect annotations for free so that we have a supervised learning uh, task? So we know the input, we know the target output, and we just fit our function, but in a way that we can get these labels, these Ys, for free. Um, and in video, actually, videos are very well suited for this um, because we, we have many things that we can exploit there. So now I'm going to give you some examples. I think, or I hope this is a motivating example for why videos are interesting, not only as videos themselves to analyze the videos, but as a way to pre-train our models so, that, so then you can fine tune only on a few data points for your target task. So overall, this is a cheaper way to collect data and to train your models. So for instance, we know that in video we have this temporal coherence, right? Some frames come before others. We have this order. For, then, for instance, we can train some networks to, given some frames, tell what's the correct order or if they are given in the correct order or not. Okay, so in the end, you would have, for instance, the CNN that's extracting features for your frames individually. So you actually are working with images. And then these features need to be good for, in this case, for instance, telling whether the frames are in the correct order or not, or which frame comes before the other. OK, so hopefully, once you train your network for this, then you can fine tune it on your target task, uh, and you don't need to use as many data points uh, to do so. Uh, another example would be, for instance, um, using optical flow. So optical flow, in case you don't know it, it's some, some way to tell, uh, given one pixel in one frame, where did the, uh, this pixel go uh, into some other frame? OK, so you have motion. Things are moving. So it's somehow uh, giving you some vectors telling you, OK, this, uh, this pixel that was here in this frame now is in this other position in this other frame. So for instance, if you have many, many videos and you want to you compute this optical flow, you can say, OK, the, the pixels that move the most, they will probably belong to the foreground. OK, that's some assumption that you can do. Of course, it's not 100% accurate, but in general, it kind of works to give you this sort of foreground, background segmentation masks. So you can just pre-train on this and try to solve this task of uh, telling the foreground for, from the background in this, uh, well, self-supervised way. OK, nobody gave you the right labels for this, but this is an assumption that seems to be good enough. So then you can pre-train on this and, for instance, fine-tune for semantic segmentation. 
Okay? So this is something that, for instance, maybe ImageNet is not giving you. ImageNet is giving you uh, labels at image level. So then you need to do many, many tricks if you want to convert these models uh, or use these models for something that's not uh, classification, right? For instance, segmentation, something that has to give you something of the same uh, dimensionality as your input. So this is a way, for instance, to get these labels for free. Okay? Or even more, you can even exploit the fact that uh, you have many modalities in video. So most of the times, you have the images, you have the frames, but also you have some sort of soundtrack or some audio in there. Okay, so you could, for instance, predict one modality using the other one, or even telling, uh, okay, giving these frames and this piece of audio, do they match or not? Okay, so that's another way to create some training signal, some learning signal. Uh, and you could do many other things, okay? For instance, predicting the next frames. Uh, so in the end, it's the same idea as, for instance, when you work with autoencoders, where you create the self-supervision, how? Telling, okay, I have my input, I, ha I want to process it through a net, going through some bottleneck, but then these features need to be good enough to recover the original input. So it's the same sort of assumption that you do, but instead of going from the input to the input itself, you create some task that is richer, that gives you more information, and in general, the features that you could learn from these predictive tasks uh, tend to be better for fine-tuning and transferring for, for other tasks. Okay, so that was all about uh, self-supervision, that very quick overview, but I just wanted you to know that you could do these things with video, and it's actually not about analyzing the videos themselves, but using them to create some ground truth for free. So now I will uh, start uh, talking about the architectures that we can use for, for video analysis, okay? So now we're gonna start working with videos as a whole, okay? So more formally, uh, we have this input signal, so in, cases of Im in the case of images, we only have these spatial uh, dimensions, okay? So height uh, and width, and of, of course we can have also the depth dimension, so the RGB channels. So video is essentially this, but adding a temporal dimension, okay? So if you slice at a fixed uh, T, at a, a fixed uh, temporal uh, point, what you recover from that is an image, that's a frame. Okay, so it's the same as with all the images uh, you've been seeing. So if we know that we're using images, we already know which kind of models work very well with images. We have these CNNs. Um, problem is, okay, the CNNs work on one image, so if now we have a sequence of them, what can we do to, uh, to leverage these architectures that we already have? So I'm gonna talk about four models. I'd say these are the uh, most common ones that you can see uh, in most works nowadays. Um, so what I, I am assuming here is some sort of classification task, okay? So we're giving one input. This is the sequence of frames, the sequence of images. And we want to learn this F function that's gonna be our neural net mapping to one uh, output value, so one category, okay? Same as, for instance, with uh, image classification, you're given an image and you say, okay, we have this object in the image, something similar but with videos, okay? So one prediction for the whole video, but you will see later that we can expand this and extend this easily to something like per frame uh, classification, for instance. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about these four models. First of them is what's called the uh, single frame models. So uh, we, we said that at each temporal point in our sequence, uh, we have one frame. So for these frames, these are images. We know that the CNNs work very well, so very easy thing to do is simply take every frame, uh, fit it to a CNN individually, uh, get your classification or your features, combine them somehow, and then get an output. And this combination usually is something very simple like some sort of pooling, either max pooling, average pooling, whatever. So essentially, you take your whole video, analyze frame by frame, do your average, then you, what, you get one, um, one feature uh, vector for the whole video, then you can classify that. Problem with this, um, uh, operations like average are not aware of the order. So I could give you this video or simply shuffle all the frames uh, processes, process it with the same architecture, get the exact same output. Probably this is not very intuitive, this doesn't make a lot of sense because temp, uh, the order, the temporal order is important, but this is one of the drawbacks of these kind of models. One of the advantages, they are pretty simple and you can 
reuse CNNs that you pre-trained for images. So maybe you have your ResNet or your Inception network pre-trained on ImageNet, so take it and extract features or fine-tune it, so you already have something that's pre-trained and you know that, work, that works pretty well, okay? So this is one of the advantages, reusing these weights, these CNNs. And then an extension to this is, okay, we know that videos are sequences. We already know that at frame level we have these CNNs that are very good, and what's the like, state of the art for most sequence tasks or tasks involving sequences, RNNs. So, okay, let's leverage the best of both worlds. Let's take CNNs to analyze the frames one by one individually, then let's take an RNN and combine this information so that we are aware of this temporal evolution of the signal, uh, and then simply classify your videos or whatever, as in the previous case. Uh, one of the drawbacks of this is that, well, in this previous case, you could run all these things in parallel in case that you have your video already stored in your disk. You can just take the video and process all the frames in parallel, that just create a batch with this. So you do one forward pass in parallel with your GPU, and you're done with this. With CNNs, of course, you could do the CNN part in parallel if you have it as well, but in the end, RNNs are sequential. So you have to do as many sequential steps as frames in your video. So if your video is very long, for example, uh, this can be slow. So this is one of the main drawbacks of this, of this model. Although it's aware of the temporal order, it can work with variable length sequences. So that's pretty good. That's something that you want to have in your model as well. Okay, but of course, as always, we have adva advantages and drawbacks of every method. Then another option uh, that, we, uh, that we can have is, okay, we said that videos are essentially images, but then you have a stack of images. So if you know that uh, convolutions work pretty well for the images, why not extending um, these convolutions to the temporal, to temporal axis as well? So essentially, if we are just inflating our signal with one more dimension, do the same with your filters. So now instead of having these filters that operate in space, they're going to operate in space and also in the temporal dimension. One assumption that you're doing here is that your signal somehow uh, has the same sort of statistics in the temporal dimension as it has in the spatial dimensions, which sometimes may not be right. Okay? So you're assuming that things like having 3x3 three three kernels works very well in the space for images. So okay, let's have 3x3x3 three by three by three kernels that should work well in time. Okay, if this is right or not, uh, I, I think this is an open question, uh, but I think that you need to be aware of this. Okay, the kind of hypothesis that you're doing when you work with these kind of systems. Then, how do you define this? Because you know that convolutions have some, okay, so usually CNNs work with fixed uh, uh, size images, especially if, you, well, at least if you have fully connected layers, or, or also, the, at the end, your CNN is only able to see some part of the input, the receptive field, okay? So you could have some sort of fully convolutional net here, but in the end, the receptive field is limited. So if it's limited to a couple uh, hundreds of uh, pixels in space, usually this is limited to 16, 32 frames in the time dimension. So is 16 or 32 frames enough for your application? Well, it depends. If you're thinking about uh, videos at full frame rate, like 30 frames per second, that's around half a second or a second, one second. Is this one second enough for your application? Does your activity last for one second or more? Of course, you could downsample, so these are many things that you need to consider here. And what if you have longer videos? So you have 30 seconds of video. You, want, you are not able to have these hundreds or thousands of uh, receptive field of the order of hundreds or thousands because you would have too many parameters. So what can you do? Well, one thing that you can do is just split your video in these chunks, usually called clips, of a few frames, process them individually, and then somehow combine that, for instance, doing the average or putting an RNN, an RNN on top. So it's essentially like working with this kind of model, but instead of having a CNN taking one frame at a time, it's taking a, a clip of frames, okay? So 16 or 32 frames at once. Problem here is, okay, uh, what if we want to reuse our CNNs, right? We know that we have pre-trained models, so it's not straightforward to see uh, how, how to pre-train this, for example, on images, because we have good models for images, but if you need to train these huge nets 
on thousands or millions of videos, this can take, I don't know, days, weeks. So maybe you want to reuse some models that you already pre-trained. So a way to do so is uh, taking your pre-trained CNN to the CNN, okay? So something that you pre-trained on images and simply inflate the filters. So you add a new dimension to the filter, this temporal dimension, and you replicate the same filter all the time. So you replicate the wakes. And then you divide by this number of replicas that you had so that the range of the outputs of that layer is kept in the same order. Otherwise, it would explode and you would break like, all the dynamics inside your network. Okay? So essentially, it's like doing some low-pass filtering here or having a very boring video where all the frames are exactly the same. Then you initialize with that. You have the wakes for that, so that's not random wakes, and then start to fine tune. And usually, and usually this works very well, and you don't have to train for so long, and you don't need so many training videos with annotations. Okay, so this is a way to reuse some pre-trained models. Then in the end, that's what most people does. Okay, so you don't want to train all your nets from scratch because it would take forever. And if you want to iterate quickly, this is a very good way to do so. Okay, uh, so finally, uh, this is the fourth model I want to present. It's called two stream CNNs. So in videos, we have motion, okay? So we can analyze the frames one by one. That's how we, have, how we get these images. But then we have motion. We, we know that things are moving in the video. So one way uh, to somehow um, like model this motion is what I said before, that's optical flow. So optical flow is telling you where did each pixel go from one frame to the next. So one thing that you can do is having these two streams, okay? So first stream, uh, that's just called the spatial stream, that's the same uh, single frame model I commented before, okay? So ju you just take one frame, give it to your CNN, this can be pre-trained on ImageNet, for instance, and extract some features or classify that frame, okay? So that way, you explode, you leverage the spatial information, the RGB information in one frame. And then what you can do is take a stack of frames, compute the optical flow for each one of them, okay, so the, the motion from each frame to the next, somehow stack these vectors that optical flow gives you, and then you squash that into an image, okay? So in the end, you're gonna have an image, let's say, with two channels, one of them telling you the horizontal motion, another one telling you the, the vertical motion. Uh, so in the end, if you take, like, I don't know, 15 frames, this is gonna tell you, okay, this pixel in the first frame, where did it go when we get to the last frame? And you're gonna get like a vector pointing from this spatial position to the other one. And it, some researchers tried this and they realized that this works very well. So just take the same CNN that you put in the spatial stream, replicate it in the temporal stream, different ways of course. You fine tune that, you train that, uh, and then you combine both outputs. And this explicit motion information that you put in here works very well for some tasks. For instance, activity recognition, when your videos are like very ideal in the sense that your camera, for instance, is not moving or the movement of the camera is very well controlled, okay? So in these very well uh, defined data sets with trimmed videos and so on, this approach works very well. Problem is if you go, for instance, to YouTube and watch a video, you have some guy with a camera like moving all the time then this assumption is not going to work very well because you have so many motion coming from things that have nothing to do with the activity. So the motion there is not so informative. Okay, so it depends a lot on the application that you have. And also, at least for me, the main drawback of this method is that this does not scale very well. So for uh, small data sets, this works well. Otherwise, the storage that you need to store all these optical flow uh, vectors is huge. Even if you do many, many tricks, uh, this uh, explodes easily. Also, if you have something like online prediction, so you get a new frame and you need to emit a new prediction, that's the next thing we're gonna cover now. Uh, this is not very well suited because you need to wait until you get a few frames to stack the optical flow. You have to compute it first, so it's a bit slow, right? Uh, so it's not very well suited for these uh, like low latency tasks. But you have to know that this is state of the art for many uh, data sets, because this works very well for some of them. Okay, so uh, now let's go to these redundancy in videos. I'm, sure I'm gonna show some motivation for this. Uh, but essentially we're gonna consider also, so different setups. So, so far we considered this setup where we had the video as a whole, that's our signal, this is our X, 
and we want to learn some mapping from this X to some output, whatever. But we could also have different setups. For example, maybe we want to emit an output for each frame. There's one task that's called, for instance, activity localization, where you need to say, OK, this is the action that's happening in the video, but also when is it happening. So it's not happening all the time. So maybe it starts in this point, ends in this point. The other, the other frames, you have other activities. You have nothing at all. You have background, whatever. But OK, sometimes you need to meet a sequence also, not only one label. OK, so now I'm going to show a bit how to do this. And also, finally, if we need fast processing, quick processing. So we cannot assume that we have all our videos. We store them. We extract whatever features, work with them. No, sometimes we can train our model, but then we're receiving a feed from a camera, for instance, and we need to process that very quickly. So some of the methods that I showed do not work very well for that. Okay. So for these real-time applications, out of these four methods that I showed, I'd say that the most promising or the ones that work well are the first two. The other ones, these are fine for some other applications. For instance, you have a huge data set, a huge database of videos stored in your disk, and you need to retrieve some information, or you're looking for some specific videos. That's fine, because you have the whole video stored already. But if you're given the frames one by one, for instance, some of these models are not well suited. For instance, for 3D convolutions, you're using future information. So you're centering your kernel uh, in your current frame, so you need information from past frames and future frames. Of course, you could do some modifications to these so that you don't use future frames, but that's something that you need to take into account, that you're using information from future frames as well. So you cannot make a prediction using only the information that you have at the present. You need to wait until you get the future as well. And something similar for the optical flow in the two stream CNNs. OK, so if you have the single frame models, I said, uh, it's easy to extend this to, make, to doing a prediction at every time step. You simply take the output of your CNN at, at every time step. You don't need to fuse all the information uh, that's using all the frames. So you use only the current frame, or even somehow you could aggregate information from past frames, but not future ones. So it's straightforward to simply meet a new prediction at every frame. But there's something very interesting in videos. So if you think about a video that's sampled at 25 or 30 frames per second, so what happened in a video in one second? If you're sampled 30 times, you're going to get frames that are very, very, very similar. An example of that, uh, I don't know if you can see that from, from the back, but uh, these two videos in the top, OK? So you see it's like some guy playing with his dog uh, in some garden, I think, or a park. And then here you have the sea and, and a boat. Okay, so the frames are very similar. And what happens if you extract CNN activations from that is that they are very, very similar as well. Why? Because you have pooling, usually, in these CNNs. So if you have pooling, um, and say that your pooling has a receptive field of 2 by 2, for example, or 3 by 3, and something only moved one pixel in your input, with your pooling operation, you're essentially squashing that change, so you get this exact same activations. So some empirical results that you can get is that if you take an Alex net, uh, network, but this would work with any other CNN, actually, uh, and compute activations at different layers. So that's what, what these two plots show here. So if you get uh, activations, the green lines are pulling for. So one of the last, more or less, uh, till the, at the end of the net, uh, convolutional layers after some pulling layer. And then you get the blue line, that's FC7. That's the last fully connected layer before the classification. So you extract the features for the first frame, and then extract them for all the uh, next frames, the following frames, and compute the difference with respect to the first frame. Okay? Then these distances, that's, that's what you get, how you get these plots. So you see, for instance, that FC7, the last fully connected layer that has, that has so where the input has gone through all these pooling layers and so on, that's the blue line. You see that the difference is tiny. Okay? It's not changing, even if the image is more or less changing. So it's very clear in this, in this right uh, clip here. But in the one at the left, that happens as well. Why? Because most of the image, for instance, is this green background where um, you're getting the same activations. So OK, yes, this dog is moving a bit and so on. So that's why you get some differences. But in the end, uh, the activations are very similar. 
Of course, some layers uh, do not show this pattern or not so much. So the closer to the input that you are, so the first convolutional layers, for example, they change a bit more. Why? Because you have fewer pullings, you are detecting these low level features. But if you go to the higher level of abstraction, in the end what you have there is some grass, some dog, maybe some person. And you have that in most frames. So that's why the last activations in the net are very similar all the time. So this is something that you can exploit. This means that you don't need to run your CNN or your full CNN at every frame because that's very expensive. And uh, with state-of-the-art CNNs, usually you cannot do this in real time. So it takes more time to process one frame than the time that you wait until you get the next one. Okay, so somehow you need to reduce the number of passes to the net that you're gonna, that you're gonna do here. So, okay, then this has more to do with implementations and so on, but in practice, uh, something that you can do is, you're giving one frame, so you start processing it through your, through your net. But since the whole net takes more time than the next frame, so you receive the next frame at some point while you're still processing the first one, something that you could do, for instance, and this uh, is parallelizing like in a diagonal uh, direction here, it means that say that you processed, I don't know, the first, the first uh, 30% of your CNN for the first frame whenever you receive the second frame. So while you keep processing the first frame, you can already start processing the second. And at some point, you're gonna get a third frame, so you can process this as well. Because in, uh, uh, because in general, you have these parallelization capabilities in, in modern hardware, so this is a way to uh, speed up the inference in these frames. You're, you don't have to wait till you're done with your huge rest net with dozens of layers until you begin to process the next frame. What happens here is that, of course, you're gonna have some delay. Uh, so you get one frame, and maybe you cannot emit an output until you're done processing a few of them because you know, it takes more time. So you have this delay. Uh, so this is a very, very recent paper. I think this is not, well, maybe it's accepted uh, this weekend uh, to ECCV, but uh, what they do, for example, is to connect these layers in this Dayana way, so with some sort of time lag. Okay, so the outputs of your first uh, convolutional blocks uh, are connected to, uh, to the next time step. Okay, so you have these sort of patterns here and they process, uh, they, uh, they, so what they do in their paper is a bit more complex. This, this diagram here, I'm not gonna comment it, but the idea is that since you have this correlation, maybe you can assume that the outputs of some convolutional filters are coming from your current frame, but actually they are coming from the previous ones, and if you do some tricks, you get a small accuracy drop and a huge speed up, okay? So this is a way to speed up inference for videos, and you have more parallel models. That's what you generally want. Then there's also another way uh, to exploit this redundancy. Actually, there's some work that we did here. Um, so the idea is that if you have this CNN plus RNN kind of model, so you process every frame with the CNN, get the features, and model the temporal evolution of these features with an RNN, you know that some of these frames are very redundant, so you get this sort of pattern here where your activations are not gonna change that much. Okay, so the most simple approach could be just downsampling your video at the beginning. So say that if you have 30 frames per second, let's work at five or one frame per second, something like this. Problem is, actually, this downsampling sometimes makes more sense than others. So depending on the kind of motion that you have in your video, if the scene is changing very quickly or not, uh, maybe you want a higher uh, frame rate th uh, than in other videos, okay? So what we can do is learn how to do this and do this based on your inputs. So the main idea, this is what we call the skip RNN model, is that the RNN, after seeing one, uh, the features from the CNN, it emits the output at whatever frame you are now, and then it's also gonna meet somehow this notion of, okay, you can skip five frames or 10 frames or 100 frames, okay? So for videos where you need uh, this, mo you have a lot of motion and you need a high frame rate, it's able to not skip anything at all or only skipping a few uh, frames while it's able to skip many, many frames for videos where you don't have any motion. So if someone is like recording this class right now, with one frame, you're able to do any prediction that you want to do. You don't need to say any more information. But if, for instance, if you're watching, I don't know, a soccer game, you need to check at some point if it's a goal, if they scored or not, these sort of things, right? 
So the RNN learns this, uh, but we don't give it any ground truth for this. So it's just something that's internal to the model. It's optimizing for the final goal for your task. Okay, but at the same way, we encourage it to perform fewer updates. But that, there's no ground truth for that. Everything is learned inside end to end and without supervision for, for this notion of skipping. And here you have some results. So you have some videos you see that in some of them you, you don't have a lot of motion. So actually with a few frames only you're able to predict this. Um, so in green, so whenever this green frame pops uh, means that it's using that frame. Otherwise in red it means it's not using it. So for this very, very specific task, you don't need very, uh, a lot of frames to, to do the prediction. For some tasks, you need more of them. For instance, if you want to do uh, activity localization in time. So you know that some activities last for longer than others. But going back to the soccer example, if you're, go if you're seeing some players uh, playing soccer, you don't need to check the next frame and the next frame and the next frame every time because you know that soccer, at least that, that activity is going to last for a few seconds. In common videos at least. You're not going to have like a frame of one activity each, right? So you know that every shot is going to last for some time. Some activities uh, last more than others. So you can learn these kind of patterns in your data to have more efficient models. So actually you get huge savings. Why? Because the CNN part is the most expensive one. So whenever you're able to skip one frame, meaning that you skip computing the CNN for that frame, you have huge savings. So in general, you can achieve savings of, I don't know, up to 90% while your accuracy drop uh, is small or no accuracy drop at all, depending on, on the task. OK, so now I'm going to spend the last few minutes of this talk uh, talking about more uh, like implementation details, OK? Because it's nice to see all the theory, but then when you have to start working uh, in implementing your nets and so on, there are some tricks that are very important to do properly, or otherwise it's going to be very slow. And you're going to see that going fast in this case is very important because you know, it's like this big data regime where you, you need to have a lot of efficiency, high efficiency. And why? Well, maybe you're familiar with some of the image data sets. Uh, so here in, in this plot, you can see I, I'm, I care more about this uh, horizontal axis right now. So it's the total number, sorry, the vertical axis. So the total number of samples that you have in your data set. So let's go to the top right corner. You see ImageNet there. So you have, for example, this YouTube 8 million data set uh, that in number of examples, that's comparable to ImageNet, to the full ImageNet, the large one, not the one with one million examples. Problem is, when you have millions of videos, uh, it's not like having millions of images. Why? Because every video has many, many images. So doing a, a quick estimate of, say that you have this image net of 1.3 million images. But now instead of images, you're going to have videos. So in this case, by doing, uh, I think, a, a very, like an accurate assumption at least that you can have uh, videos at 30 frames per second, uh, sorry, 24 frames per, per second, that's standard, and at 30 seconds, you get something that's orders of magnitude larger than image net. Okay, so you have, image net already takes days or weeks to train if you have one, two GPUs. Okay, so if you, if you have something that's orders of magnitude larger, uh, you really need to use more GPUs and code everything in a very efficient way. And also do some tricks like what I was saying before, that you can downsample your videos because not all that information is very relevant because it's redundant. But let's go more to, to the implementation part. Okay, so something that you probably want to do uh, is using more GPUs because one of the problems is that with the current state of the art CNNs, you can feed small batches, like 32, 64 frames per batch, so images per batch, which means that that's up to 64 frames in a batch. And videos have many more frames, okay? You're not talking about 64 frames per video most of the times. Uh, so you need more memory here. But of course, first thing you could do is, okay, let's use more GPUs. But before going into that, because that's expensive, you could do other things like, for instance, if you're going to reuse some pre-trained CNN, freeze some layers. If you freeze some layers, it means that you can run the forward pass only once for the whole data set, extract those features, and then load these features instead of the raw video. So you skip all the computation of these features. So if you think about training for, I don't know, 100 epochs, it means that instead of processing every frame 100 times through your CNN, 
uh, you're going to process it only once. So that's like a 100-fold uh, uh, increase in efficiency, let's say, your reduction in the number of computations that you need to do. So that's a common trick. So if you freeze them, you don't do backprop. You can just use them as a feature extractor. Um, or other things that you could do, well, uh, you could go to multi-GPU settings. That's what most researchers do nowadays, uh, nowadays at least for video. So if you have, I don't know, four eight GPUs at your disposal, you can use them. Uh, but you really need to, to be careful with this. So sometimes, uh, that's something that happens most of the times with deep learning researchers, is that we are always complaining about not having enough GPUs. Like, okay, I need more GPUs to parallelize, to speed up our models, and so on. But, okay, first, you need to make sure that you're using your only GPU at 100%. This doesn't happen all the time. So for example, one, one common mistake is not loading the data properly. So something as simple as loading the data can have a huge impact in the speed at which you can train your models. So for example, say that you load a batch of data, process it with your GPU, you update your wakes, then go to disk and again load your data and process another batch. That's very inefficient because while your CPU is busy loading data from disk and pre-processing the data, your GPU is not doing anything. It's in idle. Okay, so you have your GPU in idle mode like half of the time. So why don't you use it all the time? One thing that you can do is asynchronous data loading. So while your GPU is busy processing your current batch, you already go to disk. So your CPU cores are already going to disk, loading the data, pre-processing it. So as soon as your GPU is done with the current batch, you already fit it the next one very quickly. So uh, you minimize the time that the GPU is not doing anything to only this short time of copying the data from the RAM to the GPU memory, for example. Okay. And then other things, especially when you work with clusters, is that if you have this storage system that's shared among many users, it, usually it's quite slow. It's not as fast as having your hard drive in your laptop, for example. Okay. So one thing that you want to do is um, store your data in some speci uh, specific formats, like HDF5 or TF record if you're using TensorFlow. Why? Because usually it takes more time to go to disk, find the proper location of your, of your uh, file, and then going back and returning it to your program than actually loading it because these are usually tiny images at least. This doesn't happen. So with videos, this is not that bad. But what you can do is, okay, you go to disk once and load a batch of data. Okay, so you load a few data points, a few samples, and then return them to your program. So then this overhead of going to this network drive and so on is uh, reduced in comparison, or at least in percentage, when compared to the time that you're actually doing something useful, which is loading your data. And well, that was everything. Uh, if you have any questions, I think that we still have some time. Thank you. <laughs>